every need. Touch every heart, every life, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey, worship team, that was great. Thank you. Why don't we show our appreciation this morning? And you also are the worship team this morning. So thank you for being a part of it together. You can uh, high five someone, find yourself a seat. Good morning. I'd like to say welcome to the live stream this morning. If you're watching on live stream, so glad you've joined us. Whether you're in your pajamas or you've dressed up in your Sunday best just to be a part of church this morning, that's for you to know and us not to find out. Uh, but we're glad that you've joined us today and trust that you two are enjoying the service together. Hey, next week, as was announced, the young adults are going to be away and it'll be a little different here next Sunday morning because um, have you noticed uh, there's a lot of young adults that carry a lot of responsibilities here on Sunday morning. So next Sunday morning, we're going to do a little bit differently. We're going to have a, uh, maybe an acoustic set, a bit unplugged, a little bit different, but it's going to be fantastic. We're going to have a great time together. We're going to create a great atmosphere of worship and uh, we're going to have a great time and we're also believing that God's going to move mightily amongst our young ads as they gather away. There's something good happens whenever we do that. Carve out time, go away. God shows up in ways that are wonderful. Fantastic. Well, we're going to start a new series this morning. A new series called Strong Bonds. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse 6. Paul says this. He says, As a prisoner then for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond, through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The theme for the year, can anybody remind us this morning what the theme for 2022 was? Strengthen. Close. Strengthen. And this series, this, this message and this, mess, this series of messages is around strengthening our bonds, that we have strong bonds. Now, this is not a series about undergarments, okay? Why fronts or singlets? So you're not, I'm not going to break out into the 1980s ad. It's got to be bonds. It's got to be bonds. Anyway, yeah, never mind. All those under the age of 30, what the... Go to the video. No, I'm not going to show that. <laughs> Don't go home and Google. No, you got to go home. And Don't Google it during church, okay? <laughs> never mind. I just gave everybody permission to Google. It's got to, never mind. This is not a series about undergarments. This is a series about you and me. It's a series about relationships, our strong bonds. And the key verse is verse 3, which says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The bond of peace. The bond, the bond, the word bond here means a belt. Something that ties something together. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of your spirit, binding yourself together, binding yourself together with peace. Now the goal is unity. The goal is unity in the spirit. And the word unity there is where we get the word, the word oneness. Oneness. Now, let's think about that for a minute. The Bible says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Tell the person beside you, nice temple. No, no, don't worry. But your body, this physical body of ours, actually is a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you receive Jesus into your life, when you put your trust in Him, His Spirit comes and lives in you. Your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is in you. Now, the bodies that the Holy Spirit indwells are incredibly diverse and different. 
There's different backgrounds. We're from different races. We have different temperaments and personalities. We have different experiences. We have different cultures. We even barrack for different footy teams. <laughs> Sorry for bringing up the football, Al. It's all right. Now, this church, this church, even on, in this church, in a group of people that are all in the one geographical location, there's incredible diversity in it. Who would agree with that? Incredible diversity. Um, so think about that globally. You think about people from completely different cultures and completely different locations and different uh, situations and different things that are happening in their nations. There's incredible diversity, and yet there is one spirit. So even though we're incredibly different, there's one spirit, there's the same spirit in all. So what holds that together? What holds that together? What bonds that? What makes the sense of unity happen? What pulls that together, bonds it? We are bonded together by peace. And you could put it in these terms. We have unity through peace. We have unity through peace. Now, to be helpful to give you a little bit of context here, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and they're having a struggle there in the New Testament church, what to do with this whole issue of Jews and Gentiles. Um, and if you wanted to find difference, you couldn't find a greater difference, a greater wall of separation, a greater line of demarcation, a greater line of segregation than Jew and Gentile. It had been in existence for millennia. And how could the Gentiles, by the way, which is probably most of us, how could the Gentiles be a part of the church? I mean, the, the Jews, the Jewish people had served the true God for thousands of years. They were God's chosen people dating right back to Abraham. They were the ones that had received the law. Um, they were raised to recognize Gentiles as dogs. They called Gentiles, Gentiles uncircumcised. They were just the uncircumcised ones. You were forbidden to marry outside. You were forbidden to marry. If you were Jewish, you were forbidden to marry a Gentile. You couldn't even eat with them. You had nothing to do with them. In fact, you were just downright unclean. Are you getting this this morning? And now they were to start on an equal footing as the Jews in the church. They were to do life together. They were to meet together in each other's homes. They were to have communion together. Are you getting the gravity of this? That's the context. Have you ever felt like maybe you don't fit in? Have you ever felt like maybe you don't belong in a local church, have you ever felt? Have you ever felt that someone else doesn't fit in or belong? I, I sometimes hear the term, "Well, I'm just looking for my people." Well, Paul says to us today, he says, "Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace." Let me look at this. Let's let's just dive in a little bit here. Let's just go through the first few verses there. Paul says, as a prisoner of the Lord then, Paul becomes a beggar. Paul literally be, be, becomes a beggar. He says, he says therefore, um, as a prisoner of the Lord, in the, in the um, NASB, it puts it that way, it starts off with therefore, and when, when the word is there, therefore is there, you need to have a look and see what it is therefore. That's right. So, in the previous verses previous chapters in Ephesians, Paul had been laying out in incredible detail um, what we have received through Jesus, what the New Testament believers had actually received, that you, know, that you were once dead in your sins, but now through the grace and mercy of God, you've been made alive, that you're now so seated in heavenly places, you're now citizens, you're called citizens of heaven, you have a glorious inheritance, and Paul is waxing eloquent about all that they've received, and then he goes on and then he's saying, therefore, in the light of all of that, in the light of what God has done for you, for what, in the light of what you have just been a recipient of, what you have received, therefore, in the light of all that, he says, 
As a prisoner, why does he throw that in? Well, Paul is just making sure that he's an example. He's saying, I will pay any price to walk worthily. Whatever it takes, I, I Paul, as a prisoner, I am, I'm in prison because I've been walking worthily. I've been walking according to what God has done in me. He says, as a prisoner, walk worthily. He says, he says well, as a prisoner, I urge you. Everyone say urge. Remember I said Paul's a beggar. He's saying, I urge you. Literally, that means I'm begging you to walk worthily. And this is actually the heart of Paul, and it comes through here so clearly. Paul's concern was not how many were in the church or how well he was preaching. His greatest concern was that the people, his hearers, the one that were receiving his letter, that they would become more like Christ, that they would become the people of God and that they would begin to walk out what God had done within them. That was his greatest concern concern in Galatians 4.19 he said my dear children for whom I'm again in pains of childbirth until what until Christ is what formed in you that was Paul's main concern I urge you means I beseech I exhort I entreat I plead I beg are you hearing Paul's heart in this this morning and I trust this morning that that's my heart that it's not just how well I preach or how many people are in church or our program's going good, but that we are being transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. And there's a sense of urgency. I plead with you. I entreat you. I'm begging you. In light of what God has done, walk worthily. There's a balance. There's a clear balance between your new identity and your walk, that we live according to what we believe God has done in our life. Are you hearing me this morning, church? He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Everyone say calling. Calling. If you think this morning you chose him, if you think this morning that, oh, I've just chosen to become a Christian, You know, I've examined all the religions. I've looked at it all. I've weighed them all up. I've read the books. I've also looked at some other lifestyles. I've checked out hedonism. And I have, you know, it's a Christianity thing. I really like the grace bit. So I've chosen Christianity. I want you to know this morning, that's not the way it works. He called you. He called you. If you're here this morning with any heart that's open towards God, You've made some decisions along the way, but let me tell you, you made them because he called you. Before the foundation of the earth, he put your name in his book. He says, I chose you to spend eternity in my presence. Now, there's a whole different heart response to that than to just, well, uh, I think I'll choose Christian. I'm a Christian. Think about it this way. If a young man approaches a young lady and he says just want you to know I've examined all the girls I've checked them all out and after much consideration I like you I think you're preferable I've decided I've decided to ask you to marry me and she goes well that's reasonable yes is that how it works that, that's, that's a whole different heart response. Imagine if a young man comes and says, I, I'm absolutely in love with you. You're the most beautiful girl I know. And he starts quoting the Song of Solomon. Well, not all of it, because that would probably confuse her. <laughs> and he says, I just want to spend my life with, with you. I choose you. Don't you think that's going to bring a different heart response? And that's us this morning. God has called us. He's chosen us. And then he goes on, Paul says in verse 2, he says, As a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. We're going to look at that in a few weeks' time. That's the strategy of how we keep the unity of the peace. We're going to come back to that. I want to move on this morning because verse 3 is the key verse I want to look at. He goes on, he says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Make every effort. This is going to take something from you. This is going to require something of you. 
You're going to have to engage with this. You're going to have to make some decisions yourself. God's done all these things, but you need to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Make every effort. There's nothing half-hearted about this. Well, I gave it a bit of a go and, you know, just moved on. Didn't quite work. No, 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 this is... We're going to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. So the question I want to look at this morning is, the goal here is unity of the Spirit. What does Christian unity look like? Is Christian unity any different to anyone else's unity? What does is, what is this keep the unity of the Spirit? Remember, we're so diverse, but we have one Spirit. What's Christian unity look like? Is there any difference? Well, let me tell you what Christian unity looks like. Firstly, Christian unity, oneness comes before difference. Oneness comes before difference. We live in times where there is an incredible highlighting of difference and diversity. Is that true? The thing that's highlighted, the starting point, is my point of difference and my diversity. Can you imagine if the Jews and the Gentiles started with their difference and their diversity? If they had started with their difference and their diversity, they would never have found a bond of peace. And so Christian unity does not start with difference and diversity. Christian unity... Does not, that is not our starting point. Are you hearing me this morning, church? We are incredibly different this morning, even in a congregation such as this. But our, our starting point this morning as Christians is not our diversity and our difference. I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm black, you're white, I'm male, you're female, I'm Asian, you're European. Whatever those differences are, that is not our starting point. Before we discover our diversity, we must discover our sameness. We must discover our, and highlight our oneness. Listen to what Paul says in verse 5 and 6. But we, are, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all in all and through all. How many of you think Paul was emphasizing the oneness? And Christian unity starts and is built around the oneness. Paul is saying, my salvation is no different to yours. Your salvation is no different to mine. We're all born again the same way. We're born again by the Spirit of God. Does anyone here believe that today? Your testimony is no better or different. It might be different, but it's no better or worse than anyone else's. We're all born again the same way. We are all adopted into the family of God the same way. We all have an equal adoption. You imagine a father, one, a, a, an earthly father could have, he could have an adult daughter who may be, may have a university degree, may be an executive in a company and an incredibly successful athlete. And he also may have at the same time, he may have a, a 12 or 13 year old son who's in a wheelchair, who is crippled. And they are incredibly different. One's an adult, one's a child, one's dependent, one's independent. One's male, one's female. But they both have the same father's love. They both have the same father's access. And they both have the same inheritance. Who believes that this morning? And so in the critical areas of life... They, they, the, the oneness comes before the diversity. Who can see that this morning? We're no different. We're so different. But we are one. Tell the person beside you, we're one. Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Think it. I don't care. So Christian unity starts with oneness, not difference. Don't you, think, don't you think the world would be a better place if we started with our oneness and not our difference? Number two, unity is not uniformity. We can get the idea that unity is uniformity. 
Christian unity is not uniformity. Paul starts off, in verse 5 and 6, we just read it, and he says, one, 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 we are one, we are one, we are one, it's all about the one. And then, we haven't read this this morning, but if you look at the next verse in verse 7, he then jumps into, but to each of each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And then he goes on and he starts speaking about the different gifts that he's given. And he starts now to talk about each of us. He starts to talk about the many. Are you hearing this? He firstly talks about the one. We're all one. We're all one. We're all one. Then he starts to talk about the each of us. The diversity, the difference. We've all been given gifts. You see, you, Christian unity is not uniformity. It's not like in the army where kind of we give them all the same haircut, we give them all the same uniform. They all have to learn to walk in step. We all do exactly the same thing. And we subjugate our individuality. That is not Christian unity. Uniformity leading to unity. Well, that's what a, a totalitarian regime requires. That's not what Christianity is. That's not what the church is. If you think that Christianity, Christian unity is uniformity, you actually miss its beauty and its wonder. You actually miss it. The glory of Christian unity is its amazing variety and diversity. Are you hearing me this morning, church? In true Christian community, your individuality isn't subjugated, but it is found and enhanced and discovered. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says. For we are God's handiwork. The word is actually poema, which is we get the word poem. It's, it's artwork. You are God's artwork. You are God's workmanship. You're his artwork. And when God created you, he pours an, listen, listen to me, he pours an aspect of himself into you to reflect, for you to then reflect that part of himself. Are you hearing me? Your individuality and your fingerprint isn't lost in the body of Christ. It's discovered and it's found just as a hand is different to a foot and it's all for every part of the body is important. Yes, are you hearing me? Oneness comes before difference and unity isn't uniformity. But listen to me, what makes then the bond of peace? This is Christian unity. What makes the bond of peace? The answer this morning is Jesus makes the bond of peace. Jesus makes the bond of peace. If we go back a couple of chapters, chapter 2 and verse 14, listen to what Paul says. It says, For he... He himself is our peace. Let me read the whole verse. He himself is our peace, who has made the two one. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. He's made the two one and has destroyed the barrier. That was a big barrier. Has destroyed the barrier... The dividing wall of what? Hostility. It's very hard to have peace where there is hostility. So what does it mean that Jesus then is our bond of peace? Well, it gives us a hint right there. He, He destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. How How did he do that? You see, if you're a Christian, hostility has been destroyed. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you have his spirit in you, it's important you understand that hostility has been destroyed. How did he do that? Well, go to verse 16. This is profound. And in this one body, 
to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. On the cross, Jesus put to death hostility. He didn't become hostile. I'm going to get you. No, no. On the cross, Jesus killed hostility. How did that happen? How did he kill hostility? It worked like this. God made Jesus hostility, not hostile. And when God the Father killed Jesus on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, he killed hostility. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, probably one of my favorite passages of Scripture. God made him who had no sin to be what? Sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, on the cross, God treats Jesus legally as if he had done what we have been doing to one another for centuries. Prejudice, hurting, trampling, racism, violence, greed. And he treated Jesus as if he had done this. And in doing so, he killed hostility. Jesus himself is our peace. Did you get that this morning? Hostility's dead. Got good news for you this morning. It's really hard to have peace where there's hostility. Say hostility's dead. Hostility's dead. On the cross. Jesus became sin. He became hostility. And he, all those things that we carry, that we perpetrate, we've done, it was put to death on the cross through Jesus. So Christian unity means that hostility is dead. Objectively, it's There's no hostility between us and God anymore. Jesus has made our peace with God. You cannot find peace with God other than through Jesus. You can try every other way by, as Nikki said this morning, good works. And if we live, if that's our position of trying to, if we think our, you know, walking worthily is sign of, that's our, our good works is actually giving us favor with God and, and, and making our peace with God, we're mistaken. That's just going to, it's this game of snakes and ladders. But when we understand that Jesus has done it for us and then out of that knowledge we now turn our feet towards working, walking worthily. Are you hearing me this morning, church? So objectively between us and God there is no hostility, there's peace. And then subjectively between each other the wall of division is gone. And so, who creates the bond of peace? Jesus does. And then he takes, so he divides the wall of hostility between us. How many of you know that's good news for your family? How many of you know that's good news for you and your neighbour and wherever else there's hostility? How many of you know that's good news? So then he takes us, diverse as we are, and both Jew and Gentile in the early church, and then he then places them, Jesus places them, in the body. Listen to what it says. In back, back to chapter 4 where we were. Go over to verse, uh, verse 11. It says, It was he. Who's he? Jesus. It was he who gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some to be pastors and some teachers. How many of you see? Jesus has taken all that diversity and he's placing the members in the body. Listen to what he says in verse 16. From him. Who's him? Him is... Jesus, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work in him. Are you hearing me this morning? So the peace, the bond of peace, the opportunity for peace between God and men 
is through Jesus. And then Jesus takes these diverse group of people with one spirit that's built around, their unity is built around their oneness. And then he places them in the body. Did you get this this morning? So, Christian unity. It's oneness before difference. I think we could spend a fair bit of time on that one. What do you think? It's unity, not uniformity. How many of you are glad that you don't become cookie cutter? We're all different, but we have one spirit. And the beauty of our unity is our diversity, that we are so different. And who does this? Jesus does this. He does this. So let's go back where we started today. Like Paul, he says, I'm begging you, I'm urging you, and I'm saying to you this morning, I'm begging you, I'm urging you, in light of what God has done in, in your life, in light of all that's promised of your glorious inheritance and he's lifted you up in heavenly places and he's taken you from death to life because of his grace and his mercy. You're saved by grace, not by works. In, spite of, in light of all that. And then you who are so different, you are God's workmanship and he's created you to do good works which he prepared in advance for you to do. Different, but incredibly unified. Doing the work that God's called us to do. Who believes that this morning? Come on, thank him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you know God's smart? He knows what he's doing. New identity needs a new walk. Keep the unity of the Spirit. One, 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 one. Tell a person or say it to someone. One, 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 one. One, we're one. We're different, but we're one. How many of you can see this morning that the beauty of Christian unity is the diversity with the bond of peace made by Christ? We have strong bonds. So what does that mean this morning? It means this. If you have Jesus in your life, you are my people. I hear people say, I'm looking for my people. Well, do you know what? You can go anywhere. I don't know what people are saying. They're talk, mainly talking culture. But do you know what? Even different cultures. You don't get any more of a bigger change in culture from Jew and Gentile. And they fellowship together. They broke bread together. They shared their life together. So this morning, let me tell you, if you love Jesus, you found your people. You belong. And there's no one that can walk into this place that loves and honours Jesus and having a heart to walk worthily. Like us, having their ups and downs, their struggles and their good times and their bad times and that doesn't belong. We belong. Unity is preserved through diversity. The glory of Christian unity is a diversity of the people that God gives us. And then lastly, diversity is enhanced and supported by unity. Let me pray. Can I have the worship team up? Father, we thank you this morning for Christian unity. Pray, Father, this morning we wouldn't know what it is to, Lord, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Lord, we've kind of been thinking macro, but we come back to micro this morning. And Father, I pray that what is true of races, what is true of larger entities of people is true of people that we do life with and walk with here. 
And Father, I thank you today and that you are our peace, that hostility has been destroyed. It was all paid for in you. And Father, I pray that as a result of that, that true reconciliation can come. Not tolerance, and not tolerating, and putting up with, but Lord, true oneness. Hostility destroyed through Jesus. Pray for your grace to be poured over our lives as your people. Brother, brother, sister, 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 brother, father, son, son, sibling, whatever. Lord Jesus, I'm asking today for the peace of God, that bond of peace to be so strong through this family of God and through the family of God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You receive the word. Let's all stand for a moment. You know, um, it's so important for this, the bond of peace can only come if you have peace with God. And the only way you can have peace with God is, is if you put your trust in Jesus. That you open the door of your heart to him and say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I'm not going to keep on just trying to live life my way, but I'm submitting my life to you. And I invite you into my heart. And I wonder if there's anyone here this morning, you've never done that, you've never opened, literally, you know, figuratively speaking, but you've never really opened the door of your heart and said, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Because you will not find peace with God. If you could make your own peace with God, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. But on the cross, he was making the way open for us to have peace with God. The price for our, the penalty, uh, the, the price for all of our wrongdoings, hostility, it was all, was all paid for on the cross. We just put a, our trust in Jesus. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning, you've never done that. While every head's bowed, every eye's closed, just for a moment. Church praying. This is a moment of decision for some people. You think you may be here because maybe someone invited you or they knew you. But let me tell you today, this is not just about you choosing God, but you need to know this morning that God has been choosing you for a long time. He's got his hand on your life. He's brought you this morning so that you could know that he loves you. He's got a great plan and purpose for your life. But today he wants you to invite him in and to know him as your Lord and your Savior. If that's you this morning, why don't you just raise your hand and say, that's me, Russell. I'm not going to invite you. I'm not going to make a spectacle of it. I just want you want to see it. Some of the team are looking. We'll just, we just want to help you take the next step, whatever that is. Anybody here this morning say, Russell, that's me. I want to receive Jesus. I open the door of my heart. I invite him in. Anyone, hold your hand up high. Anybody? Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for peace with God this morning. We don't take that for granted. We thank you that, Jesus, you have made our peace with God. And now, Father, because you've made, we have peace with you, Father, it's possible to have peace with our brother, our sister, and others. Father, I thank you that you've removed the wall of hostility. Father, I pray that we as your church would know the unity of the Spirit that only the Spirit can bring through that bond of peace, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Do you receive it this morning, church? I trust you do. God bless you. We're going to continue on this next week. Um, I want to talk about next week just how involved does that really mean I need to be? What, what does this actually require of me? And I think next week's a game changer for many of us. So that's next week. Don't miss it. And, uh, and then we're going to get into some of the strategies for peace, humility, and the other things that are listed there in Ephesians. So it's going to be a great series. I'm excited for it. But I'm believing that God's going to open our mind and give you a revelation as we go through, and it's going to become real to you in a way that God's Word only can. Amen. Wonderful. Well, we're going to receive our giving this morning. Um, God bless you throughout. Our legacy time, thank you for your generosity and your giving. May God bless you this morning as you've given. And
Just praying that throughout this year, that as you continue to put God first in your finances, that you would know the provision of God and the favor of God and the blessing of God upon your life, but also upon that which you're given. You know, we can have all the vision in the world, but it doesn't come about unless there's provision. And the provision for the vision does not come about through bingo here on Friday nights. It comes through the faithful giving of God's people. And that's you. So thank you. Thank you. So Father, bless our giving this morning, whether it's happening online or however we give it, whether it's on the way out. Father, I'm praying this morning that you would bless every giver. May they know your provision as they trust you. May they grow spiritually and in faith like they've never grown before as they bring you into this most tangible, measurable area of their life. So bless our giving this morning. Multiply it back to the giver, but also that it would multiply and feed a multitude. A few loaves and fishes even would feed a multitude today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. There are giving slips on the seat in front of you if you want to use those as a tool and a help. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Um, Nikki's going to come and close the service. Thank you, darling. And then the worship team's going to send us out with a great song. God bless you. Great message. Thanks, Russell.